Welcome to Unlikely Intersections, the podcast where intent, impact, and inquiry inspire our conversations. I'm Dr. Philip Brown with my good friend, Dr. Terry Jackson, and you're at the intersection. Fascinating thing about intersections is that we all go through many intersections daily. The way we navigate these determines the trajectory of our days and of our lives. Great topic today, Terry. We're going to talk about thinking the unthinkable. Yeah, that is a great topic. I um, was doing a little bit of, I don't know, reading or looking at some videos, and I came across a book, uh, and it was Thinking the Unthinkable, and uh, that resonated with me. And as I began to look at some of the examples of uh, what was discussed in the book, and just thinking about things in life. That's how things happen. Pretty much everything. Yep, that's how things happen. I'm going to think the unthinkable, and all of a sudden we look around, we see all these creations and inventions because somebody thought the unthinkable. And we see it in the positive realm and the negative realm from from time to time, (laughs) a lot lately it seems like. But the fascinating thing to me is... At some level, those thoughts, that thought process just has somebody get to a point where they can say, I'm just going to, I'm just going to have this happen no matter what barriers are in the way. That's right. And what often happens is when that person has that thought process that there are no barriers that's going to stop them. It's interesting because then you begin to see other stories of other human beings who at some point in time in that time frame have done just the same. And we were talking earlier, you know, we remember when in basketball in the dunk contest it was like Dr. J going from the foul line and it was like to dunk a basketball and it, that was just wow. You know, but he had to be able to think that, right? Thinking the unthinkable that he did it. And then all of a sudden, we begin to see more and more basketball players being able to jump from the foul line. And then it was the 360 dunk, right? Jumping in the air, turning 360 degrees and dunking the ball. Wow, body control. But then we begin to see other people being able to do the same thing because they were able to think the unthinkable and they, I think it's, uh, they begin to, what is it? Believing is seeing. They could see themselves. It's like close the eyes and see it. And, and all of a sudden, all of these barriers begin to fall in human performance because someone did it and then others say, well, I can do the same thing. I let me think the unthinkable and then let me do what we said we previously couldn't do. That's always how mankind has kind of performed. It's like the four-minute mile before Roger Bannister broke the four-minute barrier. It was thought that the human heart would explode right? You know, <laughs> at, at, at a workload that high. Now, basically, I think that to win the high school state championship in California, you got to be able to break a four-minute mile. <laughs> it's interesting. Now, so we now we, – we just went from – I guess the 60s, with grown men to now high schoolers. When in fact, as you just said, they thought the heart might explode because they just didn't know how far or how far you could push the human body. And I've always told people this, the body is meant to be worked. It's not meant to stay still. It's meant to be worked. It is a machine. Yeah, it, that's one thing that for sure is is true, and we get wrong. That's one of the I'm I'm guilty of it myself. Is that you can definitely take the the resting element too far, and mm-hmm. you know if you do that, then basically you are going to lose body resilience. You're going to lose flexibility. You're going to lose mm-hmm. strength as you age, and all these kind of things. So some of the stuff that you know, I would advocate from a health standpoint really is maintaining that high activity level and mm-hmm. and understanding that there is a use it or lose it phenomenon mm-hmm. with the mm-hmm. body. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. So 
you know, I definitely believe in thinking the unthinkable. I think most people probably do. That's how a lot of people have achieved uh, a lot of what they've done. Because uh, if you ask me years ago, some of the things that I've achieved today, I, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't do that. But somewhere down the line, because of what I saw, what I experienced, all of a sudden I began to think a little bit differently. And all of a sudden, certain things began to happen, whether it's the, you know, from the preparation. Uh, but I think at some point in time, we all think the unthinkable. As you said, whether it's positive or negative. Well, the human potential is so high. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and what I see a lot is folks are able to conceive of the unthinkable being done. It's a lot harder sometimes for folks to conceive of themselves doing the unthinkable. Mm-hmm. And that's an artificial limit a lot of times. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the fact that so many great things, whether it's putting a man on the moon, whether it's breaking the four minute mile, whether it's any of the athletic feats that we've seen and that, that sort of progression mm-hmm. to almost superhuman proportions at times, you know, that all started out that way, but it's almost as if in order for it to become mainstream that a given thing is possible, it has to happen a lot of times, a lot of, you know, before people believe it. But yet there's evidence that that happens all of the time, especially after the first feat has been accomplished, right? It's like everybody else comes along and it's like, wow, now it's the norm. When in fact, at one time, we couldn't think of it. We couldn't fathom that this could happen, right? Let's talk about Babe Ruth. Uh, home run record, right, 715. Then all of a sudden here comes uh, Hank Aaron. And then, you know, after that, and, and this will be a, an asterisk beside Bobby Bonds, right, and and, and Mark Aguirre, and, 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 of course, asterisk beside those guys, and, and uh, Jose uh, Canseco as well because of the, the doping age, right. But all of a sudden, guys are just hitting baseballs, out of the park on a regular basis, right? And, you know, we never would have thought that uh, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar's scoring record in the NBA would be surpassed, right? But it has been, right? It's interesting if we would have never heard the word limitation where we would be if it was never a part of our vocabulary, where would we be as human beings if we were never introduced to the word limitation or limits? That's a fascinating question. It makes me uh, remember, I I read an article recently that that the first person who's going to live to be 150 years old has already been born. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, You're thinking, 150? Yeah. Man, you know, average life expectancy is half that. Mm Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, but yet that's possible. It, what does it mean, and how should we adapt mm-hmm. to be able to, you know, have people live that long? Some things probably need to change. I saw an article yesterday that said, for those companies who are focused on creating products and services for the young, given the fact that the life expectancy is getting longer, we really need to start looking at creating products for the older who are living longer now because they're they're living longer, healthier lives versus many years ago uh, when someone got older, you kind of saw them as not having a productive lifestyle when in fact today the, the lifestyles are more productive and so focus on creating those kinds of products and services to work for those people versus the younger people. It's, it's quite interesting take. Yeah, and I get at it in Do You Speak Patient, the book, mm-hmm. right, under maintaining health. Mm-hmm. And it's so much more effective to maintain health than to try to restore it. Mm-hmm. 
Um, and when you start talking about longevity, it's even more critical because we're never going to, we're never going to, I say we're talking about no limits and I'm saying we're never, we're really going to struggle to create systems that take care of people as infirm as many people are as we experience this wave of aging. Mm-hmm. It's going to be very difficult to do that. And so the the real thing to do, and, and it's it's better not only for the greater good for the system, but it's better for the individuals, is how do we create this, this health movement mm-hmm. so that people are preserved? You know, you get this, it's still a finite time, even if you live to be 150, that's still a finite time. And it's really not all that long in the mm-hmm. grand scheme of things. But how do you, how do you preserve mm-hmm. yourself as long as possible, whether we talk about our mental health, mm-hmm. our physical health, our financial health? Mm-hmm. I mean, imagine, you know, the whole, in America, Social Security, right? Mm-hmm. So basically, mm-hmm. you're going to have it where people – retire in my age you know i'll be eligible 67 or whatever for for medicare mm-hmm. and live to be 150 right right right, 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 you know right, I mean? right, right. how is that going to work right. under the current system i mean it really can't right and so it's time to be trying to think of the unthinkable right so how does this actually end up playing out and working yeah that's that's very interesting because you know there's so much that has to change around laws, policies, procedures, you know, uh, heck, take a look at Tom Brady and how long he played productively as the quarterback in the NFL. Now, we're calling him the GOAT, but someone is going to come along who's going to play longer and have a more productive life and a more productive career. We may not see it, but it is going to happen. Oh, sure. Yeah, absolutely. You know, just like all Johnny Unitas' stuff is long surpassed. And, uh, you know, it, and that's really how it's intended to be. Mm-hmm. It's important for us, though, who are here now to try to do some solutioning for what it may look like in the future in terms of preparing our, our built environment, for instance, to to be more suitable to that, mm-hmm. but n- not just to be suitable in the sense of accommodation. It's how do we make it more suitable to drive that, right? To drive that better health, mm-hmm. to make it possible for more people to experience the fullness of, of life at, at longer level. You know, that's certainly possible. We know it exists in blue zone communities across the world. Mm-hmm. Um, so the unthinkable is how do you scale that? And when you think the unthinkable, you're also thinking from a perspective of abundance. Right. Because how do you scale? How do you achieve it's all about more, right? It's all about better. And you can't think from a limit or scarcity perspective if you're talking about more and and better and longer. It is truly from a place of understanding what abundance actually is, right? And so uh, we have to be mindful of the vocabulary that we use when we are talking about this. We don't want to sound oxymoronic, right, about this. Uh, And that dictates your mindset. And it's hard to do because for the most part, we only have our experiences to draw on in terms of what we think about for possibility. And you know, the great thinkers figured way beyond that, right? Mm-hmm. Like the mm-hmm. Einsteins of the world, the Feynman's that under, that really mm-hmm. were able to explain scientifically what was ma- what was going on, right? Things that maybe the spiritual masters had mm-hmm. 
had explained intuitively thousands of years ago, mm -hmm. but now we have a scientific mathematical explanations for it that even though you can do the calculation, it still gives you new questions oh, yes. that are unanswered at this point. Yes, yes. And that work has to be put in, right? That trial and error, uh, as we keep referring back to Einstein, right? That trial and error has to happen in such a way um, that there are new scholars who are working on, you know, this work it, where it becomes the norm for those scholars to work on this particular kind of work. How do we extend how do we productively, with a specific quality of life, extend the life of the human being, right? Mm -hmm. Given all of the, um, given, given all of the cognitive abilities that are, are needed and the physical abilities, you know, how do you go about, you know, doing that? Thinking the, you know, the the uh, the unthinkable. It's amazing. Well, you know, an example is flow of information. Right. Mm -hmm. When you start talking about that handoff between, you know, this great thinker and the next generation and the next generation, you, know, you have smaller examples of that all along. So, you know, interestingly, in, in healthcare, that flow of information really is one of the things that provides the greatest hazard because there are lots of barriers to mm -hmm. flow of information. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the average person, and we'll just take the United States, they're mobile. You know, people go on vacation. Mm -hmm. They go out of the country, but certainly within mm -hmm. the country mm -hmm. all the time. They're mm -hmm. moving around. And their medical information is marginally portable mm -hmm. between systems. So if I were to go even to a different place in North Carolina, mm -hmm. the ability for, and, and have a health problem, the ability for that system to really get my medical information would be limited. Mm -hmm. And we know that doesn't make any sense, right? Look at, look at what the technology players are able to do from an information standpoint. Look at the cookies on your Mm -hmm. phone or on your browser and how it, you know all these preferences are you know, patterned mm -hmm. and we can't do that with with a basic historical record very mm -hmm. effectively or said differently we don't do that mm -hmm. uh, you know those are those limitations are basically born out of a scarcity mindset mm -hmm. and you have big players that are that are limiting that flow of information because it's in their business self-interest. <laughs> and that's the key, right? The business self-interest. <laughs> that dictates so much that was happening. I think we were just having a conversation earlier about um, Kanye West and his experience uh, a couple months ago and how all the his sponsors kicked him out and all of a sudden within the last probably five days, you know, Adidas signs him again because of Revenue, money, uh, growth, right? Um, they understand that given the limits that they had at that particular time, um, they needed more, more, right? Which leads to they probably came up with a great narrative as to why, but it still had a, a, a version of thinking the unthinkable. Uh, but when we go through history and we look at all of the human feats, um, high jumping, you know, guys jumping 7-Eleven, that's, that's a heck of a feat because somebody can see themselves doing it, right? Oh, I just, I've been paying attention to this young lady uh, who runs track, Shikari. Last year, she had a not-so-good year. Her mother passed, you know, 
the whole marijuana piece. This year, it's a whole different ball game. She's refocused. You can look at her body and tell that she's really done a lot of training. And there have been very few races, if any, that she's lost this year. And she's setting record times <laughs> wherever she's running. So she's come back with a vengeance because she was able to think the unthinkable about what her career could actually be. And I think it's so important to put it in the everyday context too, right? Like we shouldn't give ourselves the free pass to think, you know, only the gifted athletes can do it That's or right. only the, only the brilliant can do it. You know, a big part of thinking the unthinkable of recognizing a greater level of possibility has to do with beginner's mind mm -hmm. has to do with starting from zero, which means that on an individual basis, there are tons of, of, of stuff that has happened that we have to be able to let go. Mm -hmm. Otherwise those things become their own constraints. I think of NC swim. I think of some of the African-American youth who were over there who said they couldn't swim, who were, who were afraid of water. A couple of years removed, they're swimming like fish. Yeah. I think there was one gentleman that when we did your celebration who got up and spoke, and he talked about how he was fearful of water. And now he loves swimming. Yeah, provided a different uh, outlet for for that particular person, and you know, it's that's an example of, of of a kid being able to do something, and those examples exist all over the place. And, and how do we build that, you know, build that mindset to a greater degree? Because to the extent we stay stuck in past patterns, you know it limits our future greatly. And we see that all the time. You know, so many of the complaints that we have are fear-based. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you see right now, you see a lot of what I'm going to call misguided philosophy around the school system that, you know, basically you have this whole parents' rights thing, which is a, a name for, you know, what people have translated into don't teach my kids anything other than mm -hmm. what I learned. Mm -hmm. What a tragedy. Right. <laughs> right. Like I would certainly hope that, you know, subsequent generations of of my children and hopefully grandchildren, et cetera, have a chance to to go next level, to level up. I mean you know, this whole business of, you know, I need to be in control of, of what my child learns to me is silly, mm -hmm. honestly. And I know that can be controversial, but the point is, is how many of those parents know anything about education, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. Like I happen to know my background was in education. My undergraduate degree was as a teacher. And, you know, that's far enough back that I don't claim to know the contemporary way things should be taught or can be most effectively taught. And I had that full background and taught at higher, you know, at, at postgraduate levels for my whole career. Mm -hmm. And so to me, that limitation is something that needs to be eliminated. I agree 100%. Um, and it's, it's amazing how sometimes when we have these limitations, how we try to impose them on others around us, right? Simply because we want to feel comfortable <laughs> in our limitation, right? But, you know, it's amazing that there's just so many families in the country where they're still the first who are going to college. Even though we think, about how well educated we are as a society. They're still first who are going to college, right? Some of that's because of a limitation of a thought process that existed within the family. 
or a perceived limitation around resources of what it takes to go to school, right? But it's amazing when you begin to see how you can make something happen that all of those obstacles kind of fall by the wayside. All the resources that you need begin to show up for you, any any person, as evidence of what can be done if you just think about the unthinkable and then put action to it. And, you know, I like to say sometimes we have to act our way to thinking, right? Yeah, man, it's so true uh, because, you know, and again, some of it is 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 training the mind or even tricking the mind mm -hmm. into looking for something different. And we're not geared that way. Mm -hmm. uh, we're geared to create patterns. Patterns keep us safe. Pattern recognition helps us create models that we can navigate through. But the breakthroughs are pretty much ubiquitously outside pattern. Yes. <laughs> right? Yes. Like, yes. you know, because yes. if you're sticking with that template, you know, you're going to keep on with that same, same thing every time, right? You have to be able to see something different to then find the evidence, find the pieces that support it, find the building blocks of what it can become. And then what a lot of times looks like a breakthrough when you go back and do the autopsy on it you can see well you know this was a stepwise progression and you know yeah mm -hmm. we jumped three steps this time and you know then we had to go back one and then we took two and it's not linear necessarily mm -hmm. but you can definitely see that it was evolutionary rather than revolutionary it was just undercover for a long period of time that's right and often times to think the unthinkable Sometimes we just have to find those examples of what it is we'd like to be able to do and see the person or the people who, who've already done it, whether those people are alive or not. Oftentimes the example is in the book. And so as we read and we find out that, hey, this is really <clears throat> accompanying how I'm thinking at this time. And it, it, at least for me, when I see that, I'm like, well, if they can do it, I can do it because there's no you know, real difference. Now, once I decide that they did it, or I see that they did it, and then I make the decision that I can do it, now it becomes about, okay, so how do I make this work? How do I make it happen? You know, uh, what do I have to do? Um, what new version of me do I have to create to make this happen? Because the old version couldn't make it happen, so guess what? More skills, more networking, all those kinds of things, right, um, that lead to the continuous process of thinking the unthinkable. Yeah, getting into the how of it is really important because, and this is an area where a lot of times we can help organizations. And, yes. Yeah, we might do it through through a workbook like the, uh, the Do You Speak Patient uh, book that has a formulaic way of looking at relationships and how things can happen. And it's really skill building to a great extent to come up with these transformations. It's skill building in a group. Mm -hmm. And that group is built out of individuals who have done the self work, just like any other team. You know, the greatest coaches in the world coach individuals. Mm -hmm. And then those individuals bring that best self to the greater game. It's mm -hmm. the front of the jersey versus back of the jersey That's name right. analogy, That's right? It's right? Shashevsky talks about all the time in his book, The Gold Standard. Um, you know, it 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 is about first conceiving it and then understanding building blocks that I have to do. Mm-hmm. You know, and then you have to do it on your own mm -hmm. and the other player and so forth. And when we do that and grow together that way, really the unthinkable becomes commonplace. That's right. The unthinkable becomes commonplace. Co-creation becomes the norm because you understand that 
my individual improvement ultimately is for the improvement of the greater good of the team, right? So there's a focus on the I, understanding that the I is going to become we, right? The greater game is always the we, but the I is needed in the we and for the greater good. And when people can understand that, that's a lot of the uh, unthinkables that can be uh, achieved. Um, JFK, let's go to the moon. And do it this decade. Yeah. Not because it's easy, but because it's hard. And That's all right. the motivational elements That's right. of that, you know, really putting that in as a metaphor, you know. And we can we, we see that play out in, in so many ways. Mm -hmm. and it really makes me wonder, though, you know, what is it that's holding people back? Mm -hmm. You know, what holds Terry back mm -hmm. sometimes? Me. I've all, I've concluded that it's, it's it's always me. It's always me. Because if I set my mind to do something, then, of course, I'm beginning to unleash all of those questions about how and why and when and where. And I'm curious, right, in such a way that I'm going to pick up the phone and I'm going to call and ask some questions. I'm going to have some conversations with some people that I normally wouldn't have conversations with. I'm going to search some books, right? I'm going to find examples of that did something. And so in all of that activity, it begins to all come together because what happens is the universe knows and senses. And so... I find that right things fall into place over a period of time, right? And uh, it's always been interesting for me when I when I get into action to see what can be achieved. I talked uh, in a previous episode about <clears throat> there's I indicated that I wanted to be a part of a large emerging acquisition deal. Young lady comes to me and says, I have a gentleman who's who wants to buy 544 grocery stores. We're seeking some funding, this funding here. I don't know, you know, what they're going to do. So I get in contact with someone. MG 100 member. They do no deals less than a billion dollars. I share with him all the information that I gathered. He says, hey, let's have a conversation. Just to be able to have a conversation in and of itself is a heck of an achievement, right? And But I wrote it down eight months ago. And so now I'm in this conversation. And it's a realistic conversation because this is what this guy does. And it's like, wow, what I've ever thought of. When he told me he had already he had raised $11 billion in an offering, so, and and he knows the industry because he's played in the industry as CEO of a company before. Just to have the conversation is 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 amazing versus it becoming fruition, right? Because the conversation in and of itself is the manifestation of what was written. It's amazing, and what comes out of that. Is to be determined. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's amazing. That's the, that's kind of the the um, creative visualization process, Shakti Gawain. You know that you can visualize incredible things. You can really, uh, you know, think the unthinkable, and it it can't backfire because the energy of the universe really doesn't work that way, mm -hmm. right? Like. So it sounds something like, you know, this vision or something better is on its way to me for the betterment mm -hmm. of all involved, right? Mm -hmm. Like you, mm -hmm. you shouldn't really think that you can manifest, well, you know, I don't like the way this person treated me, so I want this to happen for me and mm -hmm. it'll be bad for that person. It doesn't mm -hmm. work that mm -hmm. way. Mm -hmm. um, 
but the whole universal law of increase and all of that allows us to see what we're looking for. And that that is a two-edged sword because we know of a lot of examples of where when we see what we're expecting, it works out badly. Mm -hmm. that's, that's how a lot of bias drives bad behaviors or bad happenings. But we can't let we can't let that understanding keep us from using it for positive. And that's the that's the real secret, right? Is mm -hmm. using those using the power of the mind and the power of the awareness to create positive things out of that particular perceptual bias we have based on maybe a vision that folks might at one point think is outlandish, right? Yeah. I, I can tell you if I sat down and talked down sat down and talked to some people that I know and began to talk about what my visions are, um, I would be considered crazy. We I all knew probably. that. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so, because everybody can't see. And so you have to be mindful of who you share it with because everybody can't see it, right? Um, not to say that years ago I couldn't see it, but as I've grown, as I've learned more, as I've met new people, um, as I've become better versions of myself, then guess what I've been able to do? I've been able to see what I couldn't see. I've been able to believe what, I've been able to put myself in a position to believe what I'm seeing. And again, you know, that whole elevation of meeting different people with different experiences, right? It's, there's magic. There's magic to it. Um, I can testify to it uh, because I've been able to think the unthinkable and then being able to do a lot of things that other people couldn't fathom who I you know, you know grew up with. They just wasn't. Mm -hmm. But it was just putting yourself in a different environment, man. Not only a different environment from a physical perspective, but a different environment mentally. I tell people all the time, I'm here, but I'm not here. You know, I'm, I'm, they say, well, man, Wilmington this and Wilmington that. And they'll say certain things. And I'll say, well, I'm here physically, but I'm not here mentally. My thoughts are here, 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 because I'm trying to think about this and doing this and getting this done. So I may be here physically, but mentally I'm somewhere else. Yeah. And, you know, that's another power of the human mind, right? Like we know that, that there's basically no limitation. Mm -hmm. If you don't believe it, think about the dreams that you have mm -hmm. or monitor your mental chatter for every half hour for 12 hours and see you'll go around the world, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, and probably into outer space. I mean, all kinds of, you know, thoughts come. And so really there's not any limitation, uh, in terms of what we can conceive of, but the concept you're getting at is, you know, being able to be the seer, mm -hmm. you know, and one of the things that, that, uh, holds us back is when people can't see hmm. and there's that translational element that's limited by language a lot of times is that we can have intuitions we can we can see things in a concept that we're we're not well equipped to communicate at a given time and a lot of times that translational gap becomes the the limiting feature and it's not until we can overcome that communication piece that we can mm -hmm. make some of these things happen. Mm -hmm. You know, I've, I've had some friends say, man, I, I've never known what I wanted to do with my life. And I'm like, wow, why is that? You know, you have to realize everybody isn't you, all right? And so everybody doesn't see, but trying to figure out how and why and how did you get those limitations that, you know, that you're living within, uh, because I've seen a lot of that, you know, because the, the limitations, when you put the limitations, then also what happens is there's a lack of hope, right, which is probably 
the worst that you can experience. Well, that's that what hope. gets people stuck, right? So, you know, if you, if you have a set of limitations that's self-imposed based on your experience, that's the whole concept of trapped energy. It's a self-imposed limitation in your mind about what you can do mm-hmm. or what is possible. Mm-hmm. And it so commonly is not founded in reality, big R reality. It's just founded in little r reality, your or my experience. And to the extent that we can recognize that thinking when it comes up, it's going to take us to weird places in terms of our thoughts, in terms of our emotions. But if we can just let those thoughts and emotions pass and be cognizant of what's happening in the moment, right then, when we're working on it, whatever it is, then we have the potential for breakthrough performance in that moment, time mm-hmm. and time again. Yeah, I, uh, I couldn't agree I couldn't agree more. Um, You definitely have to be able to see it. And you're right, everybody can't see. And there's evidence of that every day. (laughs) You You see the evidence of those who can see and those who can't see. You see it every day. So it's not anything that's hidden. You know, all you have to do is take a ride through town sometimes and look and observe. And you see those who can see and those who can't see. Um, And then when you're talking with friends, you can hear in their vocabulary the ability to see, the ability to not see, what the limitations are and how the limitations were, um, where they originate, right? All you got to do is listen to a person's language and you you kind of figure that out, right? Um, one of the things I've often mentioned in some of our episodes is the fact that the little wins, how the little wins add up. And the little wins enable you to think the unthinkable because now you go from believing is seeing to seeing the evidence of the little wins that you've been able to create, which propels you to say, I'm looking for some bigger wins, but I know that based upon the confidence I have from achieving the small wins, I can achieve the big wins, right? It's like going from division, uh, you're a division two coach, and all of a sudden you get division one mid-tier, and then all of a sudden you're ready for the big boys. You're ready to go become the, one of those power five because you've prepared yourself with the little wins and you've built the necessary skill set and the confidence and so the limits that you may have once had at Division Two have been removed because you've proved yourself. No different than Deion Sanders going from Pee Wee to high school, and now he's you know he's he was at Jackson State, and now he's at the Colorado Buffaloes. Yeah, yeah. I mean it, you know, and I think it's important. You know, we talk about this concept of of being able to see, of being the seer. It's also important to understand that there are significant periods of time in all of our lives where we can't see no matter Mm -hmm. how much we're trying to. Mm -hmm. That's okay. That's part of it. Now, what underlies that? You know, like how do we, how do we navigate that? And there's specific work that we can do that we can help Mm -hmm. people with, you know, but the truth of it is, is often, you know, in, in simplification form is that if I'm hung up in my own thoughts which are based on my biases, if I'm hung up in my own emotions, and so I take a track before I've had a chance to really observe what's going on in the environment that I'm actually in. Mm -hmm. Not the environment I'm worried about I might Mm -hmm. be in. There's Mm -hmm. a big difference there. Mm -hmm. Those are the things that blind us. Right. Right. Again, it's that detachment piece where if you can put yourself in a situation where you understand that you are aware of what you're thinking, what you're feeling, and what you're seeing. Mm-hmm. Then that's a space where where miracles can happen every day, and they do. 
for people. And it's also okay that you can't maintain that space all the time because mm -hmm. none of us can. That's right. Right? right? There are too many, too many um, rich things that have happened throughout the course of our lives, and those experiences can be positive or negative. But without a doubt, things are going to come up that draw our awareness, that take our consciousness down a track. I mean, you can think about it. If you really watch a really good movie, mm -hmm. like you're just gone for two hours, right? right? You're in that, you know, like it is where you are completely. That's your awareness being drawn directly to something. You know, if somebody is, when they first fall in love, mm -hmm. you are mm -hmm. totally there. Mm -hmm. And a lot of other awareness is just absent. Those things are, are, are good. If you mm -hmm. have a great tragedy in your life mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. you are sad, that's consistent. Mm -hmm. Right, like, mm -hmm. and that's fine, and that's mm -hmm. going to take a certain amount of energy, but at some point it has to pass, because if it if it doesn't, if you trap that down inside, mm -hmm. it's going to get triggered by something. It's going to come out, and it's going to prevent you from being able to see what's actually in front of you at the time. It's really a formula for human happiness, which is inside all of us. Yep, inside all of us, and you know, one L eliminates another L. Let me explain. Your willingness to learn eliminates limitations that you've placed on yourself, right? Because it gives you new skills. It takes you a different place mentally and physically. And so if you can just remember, learning in and of itself eliminates limitations because there's an expansion of thought. There's an expansion of vision, of sight that happens with that learning that takes place, right? Not that you're going to know it all when you go to the table. Because I know I'm at some tables now that I don't know. But the first thing I say, hey, you know, I need a little bit of assistance. Or I need to go back and do some review. I need to go back and study to show myself approved, right? And that's what you have to understand because that's all a part of the learning process, right? Like Dr. Rao says, our only real job is to work on ourselves. Yeah, and we got an episode, I think, Return on Learning or Return on yes. Knowledge that talks about the ROI of, of that self-work and how it does, uh, you know, it, it, that's what creates abundance, right? Yes. When it's a combination of the tools we give ourselves and the baggage that we release, that you know we all carry mm -hmm. i mean you know the human condition is filled with suffering mm -hmm. you know buddha mm -hmm. i mean you know, mm -hmm. suffering mm -hmm. mm -hmm. and and the thing is is that that suffering can either be reduced or increased based on how we let things flow through us experiences that we attached to either because we hang on to it because it was a good experience or we kind of bury it and it traps us because it was a bad experience. Both of those things r rear back up at points when they get triggered and keep us limited in a given moment. And so to the extent that we can just be cognizant of that and just allow those thoughts and emotions mm -hmm. to pass, it opens up possibility. And that's what we're talking about is, you know, the whole thing of thinking the unthinkable is really just possibility. That's all it is. That's all it is. Whether it's me co-creating with someone else to make that happen, me transforming my thinking to make that happen, right? Um, finding some framework that enables me to walk me through uh, what happens, like the tell me framework, right? Because it's applicable across all industry in everyday life. So I should be able to think the unthinkable. And from a very simplistic perspective, we probably think of the unthinkable every day, right? We may ask questions that people would have never thought that you would ask about a particular topic. And that was actually thinking the unthinkable. So it's nothing that's real complex. We make sometimes we get in these conversations. It sounds so complex, but it's very it's very simple, right? Um, you sit around. And you say, you know what? I never thought about that. 
from that perspective before. That's really a version of thinking the unthinkable, right? We just don't think about it that way. Yeah, and you know what happens so often is that one of those ideas comes out, maybe it comes out as a question, and then I myself or some other individual in a group setting comes up with a litany of reasons based on experience why that can't possibly be Mm -hmm. right and most of the time those reasons are perfectly valid in that person's experience even if it's my own Mm -hmm. but if you go back to the understanding that all those things that are in my experience were just a reality Mm -hmm. not the reality Mm -hmm. then you begin to realize that hey this thing that sounded kind of way out there might be just right around the corner can I see around the corner to get it I remember when the, uh, let me make sure I got the right name for this device that came out because it no longer exists, but it was the Walkman, right? The Walkman came out, you know, who would be thinking about, you know, you got your music on your hip, you got your headphones on, you're walking around, right? Before that time, it was the stereo or the big old beatbox or whatever it was, right? But now somebody condensed it down to a, a Walkman, right? And now, instead of being, you don't have to have a stereo in your car, a stereo in your home anymore, you go to Alexa. Alexa, and it plays your favorite, (laughs) your favorite songs, right? But who would have ever thought that? Somebody had to think the unthinkable to put that, to make it reality, right? You're a physician. Robots in the operating room, right? Who would have ever thought that some years ago? Yeah, I mean, it's uh, it's fascinating. I remember when we first started doing the first Da Vinci cases Mm -hmm. uh, at East Carolina in Greenville. It was the cardiac surgeon there, Dr. Chitwood, world expert in robotic mitral valve repair and as a result of all that, we got into different general surgery operations with that. And it was really the early work of that, Mm -hmm. of that tool. And now it's, you know, it's evolved a great deal. It has very, uh, important applications that, that, you know, it has become the best way to do certain things, Mm -hmm. you know, and then there are other things along the way that turns out it is not as good for as just, you know, an old way of doing, but you had to go through the process. That's right. The electric car. And everywhere you turn now, car companies are are, are marketing the electric cars, right? Uh, At somebody somewhere thinking, you know, the unthinkable. You got the, uh, the, the, the vacuum cleaners that go across the, you know, the rug on their own. They're just... Miraculous if you got a dog, let me tell you. (laughs) I'm sure. (laughs) It makes a big difference. So, you know, there's all kinds of examples in in, in our world of somebody thinking the unthinkable to make it happen. And so everybody has that ability to think the unthinkable, right? It's just, it's amazing when you begin to remove the limitations, how much people can actually see. You know, a lot of environments cloud people's uh, vision of what could actually be, what the possibilities could actually be, and um, there are very there there have been very few impossibilities when we think about the evolution of mankind, the human being. Right, just about every obstacle that the human being has faced, we've been able to. Um, succeed you know there's only one and that's beating death but outside of that you know going off into space going to the depths of the ocean uh running sub four minute miles uh you know uh usain boat you know was it 9.8 uh 100 meters i mean it's just been amazing Yeah, it honestly, you know, and those are the things that ultimately give hope Mm 
yes. hope for the future, hope that things are going to be okay, and that not only are they going to be okay, but if we'll let them, mm-hmm. if we'll get out of our own way, they'll be better. Mm-hmm. Agreed. Well, I think we've done it. I hope you enjoyed this episode for our listeners. Join us at unlikelyintersection.com or on YouTube at Unlikely Intersections or on Facebook at Unlikely Intersections. You can find me at docphilipbrown.com, which has all the links to my social media as well. And Terry, where can we find you? You can find me at LinkedIn, uh, Terry Jackson, PhD. You can go to my website, jcgconsultinggroup.com. You can also find me on Facebook. We'll see you guys at the next intersection.